Hello everybody and welcome to today's kitchen session on false confessions. My name is Zazel and I'm a HE advisor here at the University of Chester and today I'm joined by Dr Glenis Holt, one of our lecturers in the Department of Psychology. Um, she'll be delivering the session and you'll see her shortly. I'm also joined by Hayley who will be moderating any questions as they come in. In terms of how today will work, I'll shortly be handing over to Glenis for the presentation. And during the presentation, you'll be able to um, ask any questions in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. Um, you can ask those questions anonymously if you wish. You just need to have ticked the box to say that you wish to be anonymous. You can also like other questions that people may have asked and answer any questions that Glenis may ask by responding in the chat function. Hayley will collate all the questions and ask Glenis these at the end of the session. I also want to reassure you that your video and your audio are not shared at all during the course of the session. Right, OK, I think we're ready to start. So over to you, Glenis. Hi, thanks, Azel. Um, and welcome to today's talk. So my name is Dr. Glennis Holt and I'm one of the lecturers in the Department of Psychology and specifically in the forensic psychology area. So today we are going to talk about false confessions and why this is such a topic of interest in the area of forensic psychology. Now, when we talk about forensic psychology, many of you might think straight away of a criminal profiler. But forensic psychology is about so much more than just understanding criminal behaviour. It covers all aspects of psychology in forensic settings, so in courts, in prisons and with the police. Now, forensic psychology is inherently linked to the law because we are interested in every point in the timeline of a crime. So from the very beginning when the crime itself occurs to the identification and arrest of a suspect through the police interview, uh, the trial itself, sentencing, and then the person's time in prison, their rehabilitation, and then they're released back out into the community. Now we can think of this crime timeline as a series of procedural interactions or decision points that are really vulnerable to the human biases that we all have, the assumptions we make, the misunderstandings we make, and the mistakes that we make that can act against justice. So making the wrong decision point at any time on that crime timeline could send the whole case off course in a direction which does not act to serve justice. So one of our drives in forensic psychology is to really try and understand and identify potential issues and help find solutions for them. Now one example that you're probably familiar with um, in the way in which research has helped to improve practice is that of fair and accurate identification of suspects in eyewitness identification processes. Because we know that human beings have really fallible memories and that presenting an eyewitness with an array of photos and then asking them which one of these people did this crime is going to encourage them to choose the picture that best fits their memory, whether they actually see the suspect that they saw or not. But we know that if we tell them that the person may or may not be in the lineup, then they're less likely to just choose because they don't feel forced to do so anymore. So changing the way that eyewitness lineups are run has helped address one of the biggest causes of wrongful conviction, that of eyewitness misidentification, and helps keep that crime timeline on track. Okay, but what else is a possible wrongful conviction cause. Well, eyewitness misidentification is really quite easy to understand, right? We can understand why people might mistakenly identify the wrong person. And one of the reasons why we understand that is because we can kind of put ourselves in our, their shoes and say, well, I can see how I might make that same mistake. What is a lot harder to understand is why anyone would falsely confess to a crime that they didn't commit. And in fact, we find it almost impossible to believe that we would ever do so ourselves. And this really strong but incorrect belief is one of the most problematic misunderstandings in the criminal justice system. Why? Because this inherent belief that a confession must equal guilt is so hard to shift that it can completely send justice off track in a way that can't always be rectified. 
And now let's be clear, false confessions are real. They are a real phenomenon. They do occur and they occur much more frequently than you might think is possible. We know that approximately 25% of all DNA exonerations in the USA have involved false confessions. So why do they actually occur? The key thing to understanding um, why people confess is uh, falsely confess is knowing that, you know, why do we actually need to know this? And it's because being able to combat that underlying bias that we have, um, that people simply don't falsely confess, helps us improve those wrongful conviction problems. Now, it turns out that the way in which a suspect is questioned really matters um, to the likelihood that they are, are going to falsely confess. There's a couple of different approaches to questioning um, suspects that the police can use. In the UK, we use the PEACE approach. Now, this is a police interview. It's an in information gathering model. So what you might see is that a suspect is being interviewed in very much the same way that anybody else would be. So for example, a witness um, to the crime. On the other hand, we have guilt presumptive questioning. So this is a police interrogation. Now this is used in some countries other than the UK, so we don't use that model here. Um, and it's most notably used in the US. And you'll note that a lot of the wrongful conviction statistics are from the US particularly in terms of false confessions that, that this kind of guilt presumptive questioning is really implicated. So it's implicated in false confessions because guilt presumptive questioning is high pressure and there's coercive tactics that are used to gain a confession. Now, this method is really effective at gaining confessions from people who are guilty, so people who actually did do the crime. But unfortunately, it's also highly effective on innocent people. Now, the stress of being in an interrogation room with people who consistently stop you from uh, saying, no, no, I'm innocent, I didn't do this, can result in a situation where an innocent person knows that there is actually no reasoning with the investigators in front of them. And they sort of uh, come to the conclusion that the only thing that they can do is find somebody else who believes them, okay? The people in front of them don't believe them. The people in front keep telling me I'm guilty and that the only way to stop this, this interrogation is to confess. So I'm just gonna give them what they want and I'm going to confess. And then I can get out of here. I can go and find somebody who believes me and I can fix this whole terrible misunderstanding. And that is really the big problem with false confessions is that the person in that interrogation room has this short-term goal of ending the discomfort of sitting in that interrogation room and being constantly told that they're guilty. And so they forget to look carefully at what the long-term consequences are. Or more importantly, they really just discount those long-term consequences. The long-term consequences are going to trial and going to jail for a crime that you didn't commit. Because in their mind, that's not going to occur. The next person's going to solve this terrible problem. So now, what does this look like when we come to a real case? I'm going to present to you the, the case of Martin Tancliffe. Uh, it's 1988. Martin is 17 years old. He's residing in Long Island, New York. And what you're going to see here is what we call a coerced, internalised confession, which is one where for a moment, that pressure of the interrogation doesn't just get Martin to confess, but it gets him to momentary, momentarily believe that he is in fact guilty. So Martin is 17 years old. He's woken up um, one morning, it's the first day of the new high school year. And he, he goes out of his bedroom and he finds that his parents have been attacked at some time during the night. His mother is dead. Um, his father is gravely wounded. He administers first aid to his father and calls the police and the ambulance and his father is taken to hospital. Now, what happens next is that Martin is taken in by the police to answer some questions about what has occurred. Now, this is not unreasonable. This is generally what happens. Martin is a key witness in this crime. So it's not unreasonable that he goes with the police and that he trusts them to, to look after him. The very first thing that Martin says to the police detective is, I know who did it. And he identifies his father's business partner. 
He says he was at their house last night, that he had threatened violence against his parents and that, um, that this business partner owes his parents half a million dollars. But none of that matters because by the time Martin is in that interrogation room, the police have decided that he's guilty. So remember, this is guilt presumptive questioning um, that is used in this particular model. So they're not interested in the idea that there is possibly another suspect out there because they have the guy who did it as far as they're concerned and they question him with that guilt presumption in mind, which is really important. Now, Martin is traumatised, un understandably. He's just found his mother dead. He's you know, terribly worried about his father who's currently in hospital and not conscious. He's only 17 years old, so he's vulnerable. He's traumatised, so he's vulnerable but he's got no physical evidence on him, okay? So other than the blood on his hands where he's tried to help his father, he's got none of the other evidence that you would expect for such a brutal attack. He's got no scratches, he's got no bruises, um, you know, there, there's no sort of um, other blood anywhere else um, that you might expect had he been involved in this kind of level of attack. The alleged weapon is nowhere to be seen, um, which you would expect to see in the house somewhere. So there's nothing physical against Martin at all. All there is of Martin is words at this point in time. Now, Martin maintains his innocence throughout this interrogation. And what happens is that the police decide to change tack because they, they, as far as they're concerned, have the right person, but he's just simply not giving them the information that they want and he's not confessing to this crime. So what they do is that they pick up on a particular weakness of Martin's and they play on that. And Martin's weakness is that he always believes that his father tells the truth. And so what the police detective does is he pretends to get a phone call from the hospital. And, um, and in this phone call, uh, it comes to light that Martin's father has regained consciousness, um, but that he has said that Martin killed his mother and that he attacked him. Now, none of this is true. And unfortunately, Martin's father never regains consciousness and he dies a few weeks later. The entire thing is a fabrication. Now, if you're wondering if that's legal, well, yes, in the US it is, in the UK, no, it's not. This is known as a false evidence ploy. Okay, so the police are able to legally and permissibly create evidence to try and encourage somebody to confess if they think that there is evidence against you. Now, the problem for Martin here is that he has been raised to believe the police. So he doesn't question that the telephone call is false. He also inherently believes that his father never lies. So there's been a truthful telephone call and his father has truthfully said that he has murdered his mother and attacked him. So Martin, with his 17 year old traumatized mind in this whole situation has to try and rationalize what has just occurred. So in that moment, he believes that he has committed this crime because he's been told so and he's got no reason to think that his father would lie or that the police would have made up that phone call. So the police kind of lead him to, to think about, well, hypothetically, how would you have done this? OK, so, you know, you've not, father said you've done this. How, how has this actually occurred? So Mark kind of gets led through this hypothetical scenario where he contemplates all the different options for how he's committed this crime but doesn't have any memory of it so he goes through you know do I have a personality disorder and um, perhaps you know I, I just don't understand that I've done this thing and he eventually kind of decides that he must have blacked out. Now what happens here is that the police draft up a statement for him but at that point in time a lawyer arrives and stops Martin from signing the confession. The confession itself exists it's inaccurate, um, it's fairly vague, uh, it's not backed up by any physical evidence and it's unsigned. Okay, so these are all, all fairly key things that you would expect to have happen to make this confession valid. But what turns out is it didn't matter at all. And that confession alone convinced the jury that Martin had killed his parents, even though he had no motive beyond the usual teenage gripes that, you know, his mum and dad didn't let him drive the, the nice car uh, and things like that, you know, sort of fairly basic family sort of squabbles that you had. But that confession alone was enough. And that swayed the jury to uh, convict Martin, who was then sentenced for 50 years to life. So 
So remember, he's 17 years old at this point in time and he is innocent. Now, Martin always maintains that he is innocent. So from that moment where he regains his understanding of what's going on and doesn't sign the confession, he never believes that he has killed his parents. And in fact, there is no evidence against him. In 2003, his family band together and they hire a, um, an investigator and a lawyer and the case goes back to appeal. Now, the amount of evidence that was gathered in that subsequent investigation, that private investigation, was so great and so damning you know, against the whole case that the judge actually said, had any of this evidence come to light in the original trial, Martin never would have been convicted. Now, one of the problems that you might see here already is that in that timeline of the crime, it has gone horribly off track at the moment that the police have decided that Martin is guilty. So all of that evidence that they should have been gathering, they should have been gathering alternative suspects, witness statements, you know, other physical evidence, all of that has disappeared because they just stopped looking. The whole investigation ground to a halt the second that Martin was decided. He was a suspect and the moment that he confessed. Now, in 2007, Martin's conviction was overturned. He was exonerated at the age of 34 years. So he'd spent um, 17 and a half years in prison. Now, Martin is now a lawyer. So he passed the bar and he is now a lawyer in New York. And he's understandably really passionate about wrongful conviction. Now, his case is just one of many where a young person has momentarily come to believe their guilt in what is known as these um, coerced internalised confession. So let's think about the contributing factors to Martin confessing and being convicted. There's an innocence paradox here. Now, innocent people are really helpful because they tend to do things like stick around to help. OK, so Martin stuck around and helped his father and called the police. The other viable suspect in this investigation uh, fled to California, took money out of the business account, changed his identity, uh, changed his name. OK, so he, he distanced himself as much as humanly possible from this case, um, whether he was guilty or not. We will never know. Um, but Martin stuck around and that's what helpful people do and what innocent people do. And this is how innocent people often are brought in as witnesses and suddenly find themselves becoming a suspect to a crime. And they had no idea kind of, you know, that this transition of perception of, of their part in this had changed. Innocent people also really believe that the truth is going to prevail. So they believe that you can fix a problem like a false confession. OK, and you can't because even though that confession is retracted, the jury have this inherent bias that says only guilty people confess. Therefore, that confession has so much more weight in evidence than it actually really should have. The other thing going against Martin here was the police investigation. So that guilt presum presumptive questioning. OK, so he wasn't given an opportunity really to show his innocence. And he became the only suspect in that investigation because that confession basically stopped the investigation. Martin's also vulnerable because of his age and the level of trauma that he'd gone through. Traumatised people are highly suggestible. They are trying to mentally process a terrible thing um, and they often latch on to the wrong reason why these things have occurred. And finally, the biggest thing going against Martin was the creation of evidence. So without that confession that he created with his words because of this suggestive questioning, there would have actually been no case against him because there was no physical evidence. Now, we can think about what might have helped and we know what will help because forensic psychology has been really focused on doing research in this area. So if we consider how differently this case might have been had Martin simply been interviewed rather than having this heavy handed guilt presumptive interrogation. If Martin had been given legal representation from the start, so if the lawyer had walked in prior to any of that questioning happening in the first place, that confession would not have existed. And if the video, there had been a video or audio recording of the entire interrogation, okay? And there, there was in fact no recording at all of the interrogation. So the jury might have been able to see the problems arising in that confession before it went to, before it, you know, even went to um, trial. So one of the things that we have now, one of the powerful things that we have is knowledge. So if we had known 
then what we know now about false confessions, perhaps some of those warning signs might have been clearer to the jury before they accepted that confession. And not only is that, you know, it stopped justice um, being given to Martin's parents, but also this great injustice against Martin himself and stopped him from living his life for a good 17 years. So I hope that that's helped you learn a little bit more about false confessions and how they occur um, and why they are such an important topic in forensic psychology. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Gladys. That was really interesting and actually it makes you think that I don't know, you kind of get in a mindset that you'd never be someone who would falsely confess, but it's interesting to see actually, you know, that this is happening. And um, there is a question that's coming from Dylan. So um, Dylan asks about false confessions for money or when you're wanting to protect other people. Yeah, they do occur. Um, so absolutely, it's not always just about, um, you know, the, the sort of police um, pressure that that can occur, um, you know, sometimes quite inadvertently. People do confess um, for other people to cover them, and there is more research that that is coming out about that. It's one of those things as well as that you do see crossing over into eyewitness identification, where people are trying to cover for somebody else, or they've been paid to say, you know, somebody else does this. Sometimes those are uh, can be more easily unravelled. Um, because you can kind of follow a path there. You can look at the relationships between people and potentially money changing hands. Um, the really problematic ones are, are these ones where often that there's no external evidence that would indicate why this person had falsely confessed. So it's much harder to understand. Excellent, thank you. So you said about um, Martin spent 17 years in prison and then um, he was released. Was there any sort of compensation for that? There was. Um, so he was lucky. Um, and I do say lucky because a lot of people don't get compensation at all. It depends on, um, particularly in the States, it depends on, on the actual sort of jurisdiction that they have been charged in and whether they have the capacity to compensate or not, because they don't always. Um, so Martin did, did receive compensation. I think he received like $10 million, which seems pretty paltry for you know, losing your life for 17 years and both your parents, I might add, um, and not having the, the real killer brought to justice. But yeah, it's very, very patchy as to whether people get compensation or not. Um, a, a lot of the time that the rules are around whether the person has actually been proven innocent or not. Um, and if you contemplate how difficult that is in some situations, because how do you actually prove somebody is innocent? Um, you know, you can say that a, a trial is incorrect, that there was a miscarriage of justice, but actually proving innocence is a whole different ballgame. And particularly if it's relying on DNA evidence, because often there isn't any. So you imagine that if somebody's been in prison for, you know, 40 years, well, when they went in, that's pre-DNA territory. And is there any evidence to actually test? Is there a legal um, route for, um, you know, retrospective testing of DNA evidence as well. So it's really complicated. So yes, he did, um, he did get compensated. Excellent. So, um, so a couple more questions that have come in. Um, so do false confessions make a difference in regards to the official statistics? Uh, in terms of um, overall wrongful convictions? I would imagine so. Yeah. yeah so in sort of the statistics of people in prison. Yeah. Now, one of the one of the difficulties with actually knowing um, how many people are in prison who have falsely confessed is that um, you know it, it is not quantifiable all the time for the reasons I was just talking about. Is that we know from DNA exonerations what percentage there are, but again, those are only cases where DNA existed to be able to actually test. Um, the numbers of people in, in prison who potentially false confessed is probably quite high, um, but we have no way of measuring these and there's no kind of standard um, sort of repository of, you know, how many false confessions there are even after they've actually been sort of, you know, found not guilty. So following up from that, so Alice just posted, I think you've kind of answered the first bit of the question here about how often do false confessions happen. Um, but the second part of that question is, is it often younger, naive people who falsely confess? Yeah, so false false confessions and young people are, um, you know, a relationship that we don't like to see happening and it happens all too often. So they are overrepresented in false confessions 
because of that age and because of that vulnerability. Um, you see the same issues with vulnerable adults. So, for example, adults who don't necessarily understand um, the consequences of what they're doing. Um, so, you know, adults that have low IQ or have some other kind of capacity issue that is going to prevent them from, from really being able to think about what is happening and, you know, whether what they're telling is the truth or not. Okay. Um, and another question about um, whether or not this could happen in the UK. So I know you said um, Martin, um, you know, they use quite extreme ways of getting him to confess. Is there something which is similar in the UK? No, well, no. So we have safeguards in place. I mean, if, it, if the police are following the procedure, um, which generally they do, um, you know, we have very low issues in the UK, partly because one of the, the things that was realised really quite early on, so in the 80s and 90s, this whole process of um, investigating or interviewing suspects really quite changed because there were wrongful convictions that indicated false confessions and it was decided that that, that was not acceptable and the system needed to change. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened in the state. So, you know, everyone's hoping that that, that eventually occurs. So in the UK, what you need to have is that Martin was only 17 years old, so he needs an appropriate adult with him. So it's not an option to just, you know, um, you know, investigate Martin, bring him in for questioning, do all of these things and just rely on his own capacity to understand what's going on. He needs an appropriate adult. You cannot use false evidence ploys in the UK. You can't lie to people about evidence. Um, you can't imply uh, that they'll be more lenient if they confess. You know, there, there can't be sort of any implied threats. So the, the whole um, the whole way in which uh, uh, investigations and interviews are done in the UK is really quite different. And it's designed to protect young and vulnerable people a bit more. Okay, so the final question, and then I'll hand back to Zazel to just finish off. Um, did Mark, did the killers of Martin's parents or killer ever get um, found and, and brought to justice? No. Um, so no, and this is inherently the problem, is that what you have is all of that evidence and all of those leads um, being lost. There was physical evidence. There's obviously, you know, alternate suspects that were out there, um, but no, they were never brought to justice. And you would have thought that if they had have just, you know, looked at all possible suspects and followed those up, that, you know, that we might have had a, a quite a, a different scenario. Sorry, one last question has just pinged in. Do you know the difference between percentage for America compared to the UK false confessions? As an well, estimate. Well, the answer is no, because we don't have that standardised way of saying, well, what is a false confession? So the UK is very much focused on the procedure, procedural side. So much more about miscarriage of justice. Like how do we look at what is a safe versus an unsafe conviction? So what you'll have is that if a conviction is unsafe, in other words, there's something in the process that is not fair, um, then a conviction can be overturned because of that. Now, what that means is that guilty people can also be let go under those sort of same rules. America is much more focused on proving innocence. So that wrongful conviction is much more about being innocent, regardless of whether that conviction is overturned or not. So quite really quite sort of different approaches to this. And, and that then causes problems with, well, you know, what does innocent mean? Excellent, thank you. And thank you. This really interesting talk. It really does make you think about, you know, what you would do in certain uh, situations. And from the questions that have come in from um, the attendees, it's, yeah, it's a clearly a very um, interesting topic. So thank you very much for taking your time to do that. Um, that's all the questions that have come in. Um, so I will hand it back to Zazel to just finish off. Oh, many thanks for that, Glenys. It, it was incredibly interesting. Um, and we hope that you've enjoyed the session as well and that you found it useful. Um, we are running many more kitchen sessions, um, so do check the schedule and sign up for any others that you're interested in. Uh, you'll find those on um, www.chester.ac.uk. Thank you.